Just there you go. Yeah. 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 Ingenuity. <laughs> Well, perhaps uh, you've heard about our guest today on the Colbert Report, or maybe you're one of the one million people, over one million people, who have viewed his TED Talk. Um, maybe you've read about him in the New York Times, or seen footage of his speech at the, um, what do they call that? The, new, the United Nations? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we are... So proud and uh, flattered to have uh, Mr. Steve Silverman here today. Uh, he is the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. And let's give a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to tell you something surprising that I have never said at an event before, which is, um, I am so happy to be here in particular because my family, including my sister Hillary, um, came up here every summer from pretty much 1962 on to just about 10 years ago. And so for me, this is a real homecoming. And my most precious childhood memories uh, involve going to Ciro's and Sal's and um, you know, hanging out on the beach. And so I have a lot of... Um, incredibly precious, like basically the best times of my childhood and young adulthood were in Provincetown. And thanks to Elise and Pimpos, um, I've been able to actually stay in one of the houses that uh, we used to stay in when we were kids uh, on the water. And so um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here. And I want to send some love to my mom, who's in San Francisco, who can't be here. Um, but it really means a lot to me just to be in Provincetown and to, uh, to give an event here is really very, very special. So uh, I wrote a book about autism. It's the first um, history of autism that goes in great detail all the way back to before the formulation of the diagnosis. Um, and there's something unusual in that most people who write books about autism are either the parent of an autistic child or a clinician or researcher or uh, an autistic person themselves. And I'm somewhat unusual in that regard in that um, I came to it from the perspective of a science writer. I was the senior science writer for Wired Magazine for about 15 years. And I had a very unusual introduction to autism, which was in about the year 2000, I was on a boat in Alaska with more than 100 computer programmers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So the occasion of this uh, excursion was what was called a geek cruise. It was uh, an entrepreneur's attempt to create tech conferences in more interesting places than Holiday Inns in Pittsburgh and stuff. So um, we were going to cruise up to the Alaska Panhandle. And uh, it turned out to be a really interesting uh, time in many different ways. Uh, and there were a lot of really brilliant people on the boat. As we pulled out of Vancouver, I noticed that they were pulling like Ethernet devices and routers out of their bags to upgrade the ship's communication systems. <laughs> um, and so they weren't about like slathering on the suntan oil and sleeping by the pool. By the midweek, they had persuaded the captain to give them a tour of the engine room. <laughs> so these were people who liked to understand how things worked and then to help make them work better. Um, so it was a really fascinating cruise. And one of the stars of the cruise was a guy named Larry Wall, who invented a programming language called Perl. Perl, for, for people who are uh, systems administrators and programmers, they know what it is. It's so useful that uh, Perl programmers call it the duct tape of the internet, or the Swiss army knife of programming. And uh, it's used everywhere. It Amazon would be impossible without it, and Craigslist, and Internet Movie Database was built uh, with Perl. And so it was a very, very useful language. And Larry is a very eccentric guy. And so he sprinkled through the source code of Perl quotes from his favorite book, Lord of the Rings. Um, and he was just a very, very witty, brilliant guy. And towards the end of the cruise, I asked him if I could come interview him at his home in Silicon Valley. And he said, yeah, sure, I should tell you. We have a profoundly autistic daughter. And this was back in 2000. I, like almost everybody at the time, 
believe that autism was a very, very rare condition, that the chances of me ever meeting an autistic person in real life were slim. Uh, I knew most of what I knew about autism from Rain Man, which actually people don't understand so much or remember that Rain Man was actually a very revolutionary movie for its time because even people who'd been in the autism community for a very long time had not seen an adult who was identified as autistic before. And so suddenly Dustin Hoffman's character, Raymond Babbitt, showed what at least one fictitious autistic adult was like for the whole world. And in fact, I talked to a mom who helped launch the autism parents movement in the United States. She's in the book. Her name was, uh, her name is, she's still doing well, thank God, Ruth Chris Sullivan. And she told me that the week before Rain Man, when she told her neighbors or curious people that her son was autistic, they would always say, artistic? And he would say, no, autistic. Like nobody had ever heard of it. But then she said a week after Rain Man, everybody knew what was going on. And she said Rain Man did more than we were able to do in 25 years. Um, so Rain Man really helped to make autism visible. But uh, when I was on the boat, that's pretty much all I knew about autism. So I went to interview Larry. His daughter wasn't there, as after all. Um, but I noticed that he had modified the sensory environment of his house in interesting ways. For instance, he had swapped out the loud buzzer on his clothes dryer for a tiny light bulb that would light up silently, so it wouldn't make this jarring noise. But that just seemed par for the course for somebody who invents computer programming languages. So I didn't relate it. I didn't know enough about autism yet to relate that to his daughter's condition. So about six months later, I was writing another article for Wired about another technologically very deft family in Silicon Valley. In fact, the patriarch of that family had built the first computer in the Middle East in the 1940s. And I asked the sister-in-law of the woman I was profiling if I could come interview her at home. And she said, yeah, sure. <coughs> By the way, we have an autistic daughter. And I thought, God. What a funny coincidence. I thought it was a rare condition. And uh, the next day, I was talking to a friend of mine in a cafe in San Francisco. And I said, God, I just had this funny synchronicity. You know, two families in Silicon Valley. And a, wo a woman at the next table said, oh my god, do you realize what's going on? And I said, what's going on? And she said, I'm a special education teacher in Silicon Valley. There's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. Something terrible is happening to our children. So it was like this really heavy moment, and I got the chills. But because I was a science writer, I also wanted to find out if that was actually true. So I ended up writing an article that came out in 2001 called The Geek Syndrome for Wired, which was the first mainstream news article, or media article, magazine article, to talk about autism in high-tech communities. And um, it came out and you know did pretty well. But the thing that was unusual about that article was that most magazine articles come out and they're like snowflakes. They melt away, nobody remembers them. I got email about that article for 10 years, almost every week. And the emails were really intense, like you could, I would cry sometimes reading them. And they were mostly from parents of autistic kids, autistic people themselves, um, and they were talking about very immediate, real, serious, day-to-day -day problems. For instance, my kid is about to age out of services. There is nothing for them. Or my son is, uh, is an autistic adult. I can't find any good housing options for him. Or um, I was told I was a genius when I was very young, but because I don't make eye contact, I've never been able to make it through a face-to-face -face interview. I've been unemployed my entire life. Like stories like that, like over and over and over. Meanwhile, the whole world was talking about autism, but they were having a different conversation. And that conversation was, do vaccines cause autism? And in the media, the way that that story would usually be told was, you would have some guy from the CDC or something, and then you would have a mom. And the guy from the CDC would be saying, well, we, we're not sure why the number of diagnoses is going up. and." Maybe it's broadened diagnostic criteria and better case finding and more community, community awareness. And then the mom would be, I am terrified for you know, the safety of my children. And so the mom's argument would have a lot of emotional power. But I started to wonder 
when did the concerns of pe those people on the front lines, autistic people themselves, parents, get so divorced from what the mainstream media was talking about, which was the causes of autism? While the families were dealing with the services and supports lacking for autistic people and their families. So I started to think, there must be some answer to, these, to this mystery of why the uh, numbers are going up so much, started to go up so much in the 90s, in history somewhere. So I went back and back and back and back, and a book that I thought, I wrote a book proposal, a book that I thought was gonna take a year and a half to write, as did my publisher, um, took at least five years to write, actually. It was the hardest thing I ever did. Uh, one interesting thing is that I actually came to Provincetown <coughs> at the very beginning of the writing process, and there was one night when I was like, oh my God, like, I can't do this. This is too hard, you know? And because it was such a huge subject and so hotly contested. And I saw a kid down the beach on a little breakwater and he was kind of dancing. And I saw him the following night too. And I finally asked somebody, who's that kid who dances on the rocks at sunset? And somebody told me, oh yeah, that's some, somebody's autistic son. And so I was like, wow, I have to write this book. Like, this is really important. And so um, I did. <laughs> I wrote the book. And I, you know, uh, anyway, what I started to do to, to basically figure out what was going on with autism was I started to look at the history of autism and take nothing for granted. And so what I discovered was that the basic timeline of autism's discovery, as it is repeated in thousands of textbooks and Wikipedia, unless they have fixed it by now, was incorrect. And that if you understood the, the real history, the reason why the numbers were going up so much in recent decades was much easier to comprehend. And so I'll tell you in a nutshell what I figured out. Um, the, the standard timeline of autism's history, as it's been believed to be for decades, is that autism was discovered in 1943 by a guy named Leo Connor. It looks like Canner, but it's actually pronounced Connor, who was a child psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. He published a paper uh, describing 11 uh, children with autism. And um, then, as sort of a footnote to that, this guy named Hans Asperger, whose name you might recognize from Asperger Syndrome, came out with his own paper in 1944 describing four children. And Connor's discovery was considered the big discovery, and Asperger's was sort of a footnote. I discovered that that was wrong. What really happened was that Hans Asperger and his colleagues at the University of Vienna discovered what we now call the autism spectrum in the mid-1930s. They discovered a condition that was lifelong, that had a very, very broad range of presentations. So some of the kids that they saw could not talk and would likely be unable to survive without daily assistance. Other people they saw were quite chatty and even gifted in some ways. And in fact, one of Asperger's former patients became an assistant professor of astronomy at a university. And yet, he was still very autistic. And the reason why he was able to succeed was that his mother was extremely supportive of his weird interests. So when he was two, he started to draw triangles and circles in the sand. And he was interested in geometry. And instead of like thinking that was weird, like she totally encouraged him and taught him about geometry. Then when he was in school, even though he was considered very you know, developmentally delayed and stuff, he convinced his teachers to give him advanced tutoring in math. So they did it. Then he got into university, and he discovered, it, like as a freshman or whatever, he discovered a flaw in one of Isaac Newton's proofs. <laughs> and so he went on to become an assistant professor of astronomy. And Asperger was quite... Uh, pointed that it's not that he had been cured of autism or gotten over the autism or whatever. He was still very autistic, but he was also gifted at the same time. And so Asperger developed a model of autism that was very, Asperger and his colleagues developed a model of autism that was very close to our model today. And in fact, in the clinic, they practiced a very progressive form of education 
in that they not only gave the, ki the kids lessons in, like it wasn't just a clinic where kids would get dropped off and be diagnosed. They would live there for like a month. They would get classes in history and poetry even, the ones who could do it. They would get, um, uh, they would do dance classes. There was a woman there who, who helped uh, autistic kids and other kids with other uh, forms of developmental dis disabilities, like get into their bodies by doing dance and, and athletics. And so it was really a, a very prescient um, operation in uh, the University of Vienna. But there was a big problem. In 1938, the Germans marched into Austria to annex the country for the German fatherland. And all of Asperger's bosses became Nazis. They weren't before. Some of them were Nazis before. And they were like super Nazis. Like, like Asperger's mentor loved Hitler. And um, two things happened because of that. One was Asperger's Jewish colleagues had to leave or else die in concentration camps. Many of Asperger's Jewish colleagues committed suicide rather than going to concentration camps. So it was a very dark time for them. It was also a very dark time for the children because the Nazis launched a secret extermination program against all, all kinds of disabled children, physical and, and uh, cognitive disabilities, as a practice run for the Holocaust against the Jews. So the Nazis actually worked out how to kill people in large numbers by practicing on disabled children. And so Asperger's patients became a target. And uh, so he did what he could. His Jewish colleagues were able to get out of the country. It was very hard to do because there were immigration quotas in the US um, so that only a certain number of Jews could come in. But two of Asperger's closest colleagues came in with help from Leo Connor in Baltimore. No one knew this. Up until my book came out, everybody thought the two discoveries of autism were completely independent and was like a weird, amazing coincidence. But actually, Leo Connor was working with two of Asperger's closest colleagues when he discovered autism in 1943. In fact, in 1938, when Leo Connor saw his first autistic patient, he didn't know what to make of him. So he sent him down the road to see George Frankel, who had just arrived from Vienna with his wife, Ami Weiss, Frankel knew exactly what to make of him. Um, and the reason why people think Asperger only saw four kids, whereas Connor saw 11, um, is because Asperger only talked about the so-called, and I don't like to use this phrase, but the so-called high-functioning kids to the Nazis. Because otherwise, the kids would have been in grave danger. So Asperger didn't tell the Nazis about the more deeply impaired kids. And so Asperger's name became associated with high functioning autism. And that's why. It's something that, you know, it's much easier to understand if you know what conditions Asperger was under. So um, there were other problems, and, you know, I don't want to like spoil the whole book, but basically um, the problem with Connor was that. He did two really big, like he did some really good things, like he rescued Jewish clinicians uh, from the Holocaust. He was a very good writer. But he did two terrible things in his formulation of the autism diagnosis. One was that, one didn't seem so terrible at the time, but it turned out to be. He only considered it a childhood condition. It wasn't until the 1970s when he noticed, hey, my patients are growing up. They're still autistic, you know. So he considered it, in fact, a rare form of childhood psychosis. So he kept saying it was rare, rare, rare. That actually discouraged other researchers. I read papers by researchers in the, in the 60s that were like, yeah, I know autism is this weird thing that's really rare, but you know, it's kind of interesting, so I did the study anyway. But it certainly didn't <coughs> encourage like, a wave of research into autism. But the other thing that he did that had, was really terrible was that after his paper didn't attract as much attention as he wanted, he ended up giving interviews, including one where he was quoted in time, blaming autism on cold and unaffectionate parents. And so you might have heard the phrase refrigerator mother. That's usually blamed on Bruno Bettelheim, this later guy who was like the first celebrity psychiatrist in America. Actually, Bettelheim got it from Connor. The father of the, the father in America of the autism diagnosis, 
Asperger thought that autism was primarily genetic, although he didn't think it was like one autism gene. He was very prescient. He thought it would be the interaction of multiple genes, or polygenetic, as he said. Um, and this was like early on in even thinking about genes and conditions like autism. But Connor blamed it on parents. And the problem with that, there were many problems. One was his recommended course of treatment for autism became institutionalization <coughs> to remove the child from the allegedly toxic family environment. So parents who I spoke to were told to put the kid in an institution, quietly remove their photos from the family album, and never speak of them again. Parents were also discouraged from talking about autism with other autism parents because to admit that you had an autistic kid was tantamount to admitting that you were so mentally ill that you would uh, harm your child's psyche into becoming autistic. So it basically produced this blanket of shame and stigma around autism. And people did not talk about it. And I spoke to a mother who you know, was like in the house raising her kid for years, and then they finally, like after four years, found a babysitter and were able to go out to dinner with another couple. And sitting at dinner with the other couple, the wife turned to the woman I talked to and said, you know, you just don't seem like that kind of person. She said, what kind of person? She said, who would do that to your own child? Yeah. So that's how bad it was for parents, and that's how bad it was for autistic people. Meanwhile, in the institutions, they, you know, obviously they were not being given uh, special ed classes or anything that would allow um, people to grow into their full potential. Instead, they were being subjected to you know, brutal experimental treatments. In uh, Bellevue in New York, this one woman gave a bunch of autistic kids LSD every day for three days. Oh, sorry, for three months mm -hmm. until she decided they were becoming more anxious. I would become <laughs> more anxious if I took LSD <laughs> every day for three months. Anyway, so they were usually put on psych wards. And what's interesting is that people say, where were all the autistic adults? Why did I never hear about autistic adults in the 1950s and 60s? It turns out that Leo Conner's definition of autism was so narrow that hardly anyone who would get the diagnosis today fit it. Um, for instance, one thing that he uh, disallowed was seizures. And seizures are actually quite common in autism, 20 to 40 percent of uh, people, particularly autistic people with intellectual disability suffer from seizures, and that was like a disqualifying thing for Connor. There were other things. Connor believed that autistic kids were um, exceptionally beautiful. Well, some of them are, and some of them look more like me. You know, so <laughs> basically, um, you know, it was a very, very rarely applied diagnosis. But there was another diagnosis that was a much better description of what we now call the autism spectrum. And in fact, the criteria for that diagnosis were imported wholesale into autism later because they were a much better description. That was a description for, for something called childhood schizophrenia. Now we know that schizophrenia, the onset, is almost always in the teen years or on the you know, onset of puberty. But in the 50s and 60s, there was an, an epidemic of childhood schizophrenia in state hospitals and uh, special schools in fact, at Bellevue alone, that woman with the LSD diagnosed 850 kids with childhood schizophrenia in just a few years in the mid-50s alone. So when people say, where were the, all the autistic adults before, they were hidden behind other labels like childhood schizophrenia. Or if you've ever heard of Temple Grandin, she's a very famous industrial designer, aut outspoken autistic woman. She, would di she was diagnosed with something called minimal brain damage, or MBD. That was also a very common diagnosis in the 50s and 60s. It's obsolete, they, hard, they don't give it out anymore. So autistic people have been here in large numbers for a long time, but they were hidden behind other labels. So anyway, so we don't, so we don't keep you from this actually pretty beautiful day, or it might rain later, but at least it's, it's nice. We should all be walking around Prime's time. But I thought I would read just a little section of the book, and then if you have any questions. Does that seem good? OK, I won't go on and on. Um, all right, I'll just read a very short section. Uh, this is from a, a chapter called The Boy Who Loves Green Straws. In a room on a high ridge overlooking the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, 
Leo Rosa is waking up. The sun breaks through a bank of coastal fog, filling his window with streaks of orange and crimson. A cherubic 11-year-old with hazel eyes under a tuft of russet curls, he climbs out of bed to give his father a hug. Leo's father, Craig, produces science videos for KQED, a public TV station in San Francisco. Shannon Rosa is a blogger, editor, and software consultant. Each morning, they take turns helping their son get ready for school. The first thing that Leo does each day is read a list of icons taped to his door, which Shannon made for him by downloading and laminating clip art from the internet. This list, his visual schedule, is written in a pictorial language that is easier for his mind to understand than words. An image of a boy putting on his shoes prompts Leo to get dressed, followed by the likeness of a toothbrush and then an icon of a boy making his bed. Leo's visual schedule parses the sprawling unpredictability of an 11-year-old's life into a series of discrete and manageable events. This helps him regulate his anxiety, which is a challenge for people on the spectrum at every age. Physical traces of his struggle to channel the unruly energy flowing through him are visible throughout the Rosa household, but only if you know just where to look. The white posts along the railing on the second floor are freshly painted because Leo splintered them one day, enjoying the soothing feeling of deep pressure as he wedged himself between the railing and the wall. There are thin cracks in the lid of an antique camphorwood chest at the foot of Craig and Shannon's bed because the chest made a perfect launching pad for experimental flights towards the mattress. The roses have adapted their lives and their living space to create as safe and comfortable an environment for Leo as possible. The location of the house on a cul-de-sac at the brushy summit of a barely paved mountain road in an unincorporated area of Redwood City is far enough away from traffic so that they don't have to worry too much if Leo slips out the door on an unscheduled outing. The layout of the building, a two-story ranch house with a floor-to-ceiling space at the center, which the roses keep clearer furniture, enables Leo to pace furiously in circles, jump up and down, or propel himself across the floor on his scooter board without bashing into walls or sharp edges. When nothing else but an hour of intense, pounding physical activity will do, there's a trampoline in the backyard. Friends in the city have made similar accommodations for their kids by getting creative with inexpensive bean bags and trapezes. The open plan arrangement of the house also lets the roses keep a watchful eye on their son, and enables him to know where they are. Lying next to Craig in bed at night, Shannon can listen to the sounds that Leo is making in his room next door. If she hears him softly singing himself to sleep, she knows he's okay. So thanks so much. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk. I'm really curious with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just want to know where you got the title from. Why? Why? Uh, I made it up. No, no, um, but, but why? But why? Um, because, um, for one thing, one interesting thing about the title, and I've never, no one's ever asked me about that. I'm really glad you asked me. Um, I, never do, I never use the word in the text itself. It's just the title. And where I got it was this. A lot of words related to autism are sort of automatically pathologizing, like they sound like disease or whatever disorder. You know, somebody once asked me, like, I notice you don't use the word disorder much in your book, unless you're quoting somebody else. And I said, that's because I don't claim to know what the, what the order of the universe is supposed to be, basically. But I wanted a word that described um, natural groupings of people who had a different neurology, basically. And there, one of the people that I talk about in the book is the guy who launched the clinic that Asperger worked in eventually. And his name was Erwin Lazar. And he had a theory that humanity, I mean, it's kind of a wacky theory, but it also made a certain intuitive sense. He had a theory that humanity was organized into clans or tribes by basically aptitudes. So one of the things that he would do was try to guess what future occupation a kid would be best at with both their strengths and their challenges. And then he would do everything he could to try to help the kid down the path towards that occupation. And so the notion that 
uh, and it was in German because this guy was German. So the notion that humanity was organized into sort of tribes according to aptitudes and natural strengths um, struck me as, oh, that, that would be an interesting way to talk about autism that wasn't like, you know, some automatically medical, you know, term. Yeah. Is there any evidence that Connor or any of the other people that did those early sort of misguided mm -hmm. diagnoses sort of came around later in their careers? Yeah, he did. Connor did eventually admit that um, that there was a spectrum, more or less, although he didn't use the word. Um, I, d I didn't tell the story of how the spectrum came to be. Could I just tell in two minutes? It's interesting. Um, what happened? All right. Wh how did we get here, which is a better place than the 1950s? We got here because in the 1970s, a woman named Lorna Wing, who was a cognitive psychiatrist in London, who herself had a very autistic daughter, by the way, um, so she knew what families who could not get any support, there was like no special education. Like parents would be told to tell their child to go in the garden and play with a ball for the rest of their lives. Like there was nothing, you know. So she knew how hard it was. She was also one of the you know, really good cognitive psychiatrists. And so she, in the 1970s, was asked by a public health official to estimate the number of autistic kids in a London suburb called Camberwell. So she went looking using Connor's very narrow model. And she found those kids, and there weren't very many of them, just as Connor would have predicted. But she saw all these kids who were kind of like Connor's kids in one way or another, but were different. For instance, Connor wrote about kids who completely shut out everyone from their personal world. Uh, in fact, the word autism comes from the Greek word for self, so it's kind of like selfism. It's like they shut out, you know, allegedly shut out everybody, even including their own parents. Well, Lorna saw kids who had a hard time with reciprocal social interactions, but they clearly wanted friends. They just didn't know how to do it. Or they would, you know, help their mom. Like, Connor's kids, you know, would be very rejecting of their parents, um, which he then, you know, interpreted as hostility towards the hostility, you know. But um, some of the kids that Lorna saw actually seemed to really love their parents a lot. But, you know, they couldn't look someone in the eye, or they, you know, they didn't pick up on subtle body language of somebody else if they were getting bored, you know. So Lorna was like, how come no one has noticed these other kids before who would not be eligible for a diagnosis under Connor's criteria, but um, they clearly have something that's kind of like what was most commonly called Connor's syndrome. Like it wasn't even really called autism much. People, parents called it Connor's syndrome. So um, she didn't know what to make of that. And in fact, she wrote a paper that said, like, Connor's syndrome might not be a, you know, totally good description. But then some, she was reading another paper by this Dutch guy, and, and he mentioned a paper written by this guy, Hans Asperger. Hans Asperger's paper was so unknown that it had never even been translated from German, right? And by that time, Leo Connor had been the head of the autism world for a decade, for you know, three, de three decades. And so he had never mentioned Asperger's work ever uh, in his own work until actually the 70s, where he, in a dismissive book review in the back pages of an obscure journal, he uh, was giving a terrible review to a book that mentioned Asperger. And he said, and Connor said, oh yes, Asperger. What that person discovered was, at best, a 40-second cousin of my syndrome and has already received serious attention from investigators, all right? So Connor buried Asperger in history. And he had really, you know, he'd worked with George Frankel and certainly knew, at least, Andy Weiss. Um, in fact, the Connors would have the, the um, immigrant, you know, the people they'd save from the Holocaust over for dinner all the time. They must have talked about autism. In fact, Connor and Frankel used to do public clinics together where basically parents would bring kids to be evaluated. And so people say, well, <coughs> Connor just never read Asperger's paper because it was in German, Connor's native language. <laughs> well, you know, Connor overlooked Asperger's paper because it was in this obscure German medical journal. 
one that Connor cited many times in his own work. You know, so it's like it's clear that Connor did not want to mention Asperger's name. Now, I've thought of a good reason, but it's pure speculation. Maybe Connor, being Jewish and having rescued all these guys from the Holocaust, uh, thought Asperger was working for Nazis. Screw him. You know? So it could be that that was why he didn't mention Asperger. But the problem is that Asperger had come up with a much better model of autism than Connor did. So what happened was Lorna's husband spoke German. And so he translated the paper for her. And she read the paper and was like, this is it. And she quietly worked behind the scenes with the editors of the so-called Bible of Psychiatry, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, and broadened the criteria for diagnosis in the late 80s and the early 90s, right when the spike began. And that she, I, I did one of the last interviews with her before she died, and she said, I knew the numbers would go up. You know, but then Andrew Wakefield came along and blamed him on vaccines. So anyway, anybody else? All right. Thank you so much. Oh, well, wait. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Do you take a position in your book on this uh, theory of vaccines influencing the onset of autism? Uh, I don't take a position. But if you read the book, you'll see that some of the things that Andrew Wakefield says, not just about vaccines, um, but about the history of autism, are incorrect. For instance, um, Andrew Wakefield says that so-called regressive autism, where a child appears to dramatically lose skills at two or three, um, didn't happen before the, the MMR vaccine, or you know, rarely happened, and now it's much more common. That isn't true. In, in Lorna Wing's survey of Camberwell, a significant number of the kids appear to lose skills. In fact, a guy named Jay Langdon Down, the father of Down syndrome, wrote beautiful, heartbreaking descriptions of basically kids with what we now call aggressive autism in the 19th century. So um, there, there are other ways to approach the vaccine question besides arguing about whether or not vaccines cause autism. And let's, let me put it a different way. Let's say Andrew Wakefield was right, and there's a genetically susceptible subset of kids who could be you know, injured by vaccines. What you would still want to do if you were honest, which he isn't, is you would want someone to come along and take out all the statistical noise so you could look at the subset of kids, because obviously every kid doesn't become autistic. So all right, who, gets, who becomes autistic after a vaccine? It's a subset of kids. All right, so what would, you would want someone to come along and take out all the stuff that comes from the radical broadening of the diagnosis and the radical expansion of public awareness of autism. I just did that. Um, and yet, anti-vaccine people don't tend to thank me for that. <laughs> but, you know, anyway. But that's what I did. And, it, okay. yeah. Sorry. No, go on. Yeah. Um, do you talk about Rimland in your book? Oh, sure, big time. Yeah, I mean, Rimland is a very interesting figure. Um, I also, I interviewed his wife, Gloria. Oh, she was the one who went out with the other couple. Oh, really? And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, no, Rimland was huge. I mean, he and Ruth Chris Sullivan basically launched the parents' movement in the United States. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they, Rimland got the idea for the parents' movement by going to visit Lorna, who launched the parents' <coughs> movement in, in England. And um, I feel you know very lucky that I got to talk to Lorna because she she knew she knew everything, and she. You know, when I look back, she was in her 80s. She had been through the death of her husband. She had nursed him at home from Alzheimer's disease. She had been through the death of her daughter. Her daughter died before her. So she had been through, like, the hardest things that a human being can be, th can be through. She was still, like, incredibly cheerful and sharp and in her 80s and just, like, tough and, you know. English. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah, but she, she was great. But, yeah, Rimland is someone who I would have loved to have talked to, actually, I have to say. But his son is doing very well, Mark. Um, he does, I, saw, I went to an art opening of his. Uh, and he, I have to say, the thing about Mark, you know, Rimland, like, invented the cure autism movement, basically, because Mark's behavior was so disturbing to him. Mark, now, in middle age, is one of the happiest people I've ever met. He's still really autistic, very, very. Um, he still remembers, like, the exact date that he rode up in an elevator with Dustin Hoffman when he was coaching him on Rain Man. Um, 
And he says, you know, he has certain catchphrases that he uses all the time. But he was like, he's like a Buddha. He was like really sweet guy. Um, and it's because Rimland put him in a community that appreciates him for who he is. Like everybody knows Mark. He's the mayor of Kensington. That's where he lives in Kensington, outside of San Diego or whatever. And so like when he walks into the diner, the waitress already has his iced tea. You know, it's kind of like Provincetown. <laughs> like everybody knows each other. You know. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it.